Hello, and welcome to this latest instalment of our reflection on the seasons of the liturgical year. At the end of Eastertide comes the great Feast of Pentecost, 50 days after the Feast of Easter. Indeed, the very name of the feast comes from the Greek word for 50. Eastertide begins with our celebration of the resurrection on Easter Sunday, and concludes after a week of weeks with this second great feast, when we remember the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and the beginning of their public mission. Effectively, Pentecost is the church's birthday, when the good news of Jesus Christ breaks forth into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. The feast, like Passover, has a Jewish origin. Pentecost originally marked the beginning of the wheat harvest, when the first fruits of that harvest were brought to the temple in celebration, and God's blessing was sought for the whole of the harvest, as we read in Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16.9. In later Jewish tradition, Pentecost also came to be associated with the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. It's not inappropriate, then, that just as the Jewish feast celebrated the covenant between God and Israel, outlined in the Ten Commandments, and thus the liberated slaves from Egypt becoming God's people, Pentecost for us also celebrates our new identity as the Church through the new covenant, and our new nature as missionary disciples, obedient to Christ's last command in Matthew's Gospel, Go, make disciples of all nations. With Pentecost, the Easter season comes to an end, and we move immediately into the second portion of ordinary time. I spoke at some length about the structure of this time through the year some time ago in the third of these reflections. So rather than repeat that here, I thought it would be more fruitful to focus on some other aspects of the liturgy in these coming weeks. In a sense, the stepping stones which help us on our way through ordinary time are the Sundays and the feasts which we celebrate. Sunday, as I suspect I have said before, is the primordial feast of Christians. The weekly celebration of the resurrection each Sunday has been the foundation of the Church's liturgy since the very beginning. Even the, the day's title in Latin, Dies Dominica, the Lord's Day, demonstrates its fundamental importance. And perhaps it's useful to be reminded of that in our modern society, where so many other things, shopping or team games and so on, now clamour for our attention, even on Sundays. The Sunday Eucharist of a community, whether it be a parish or a monastic community, should always be the liturgical high point of the week. Alongside the Sundays come the Church's feast days. Feast days come in all shapes and sizes. Some, especially saints' days, are anniversary feasts, marking the heavenly birthdays, or dies natalitiae, of the martyrs and confessors, that is, the date of their death and entry into heavenly glory. Other anniversary feasts are more hidden. For example, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross on the 14th of September actually marks the anniversary of the dedication of the Church of the Resurrection, what we now call the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, on that same date in 335 AD. Some feasts, as we've mentioned several times now, reflect the narratives and chronology of the Gospels, such as the Annunciation on the 25th of March, nine months before Christmas Day. The very timing of that feast thus emphasises the truly human nature of Christ's coming in our flesh, his gestation, 
is the same as ours. Other feasts are more theological in nature, reflecting developments in the Church's understanding of the history of her salvation. Others still take their origin in pop popular devotion, often starting as local celebrations and then spreading to become universal feasts. And the first few weeks of ordinary time are rich in all these different types of feast. On the Sunday after Pentecost, we celebrate Trinity Sunday. In a sense, every day, every liturgy is always a celebration of the work of the whole Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, in our cre creation, our redemption and our sanctification. Yet, by the beginning of the 14th century, it was felt appropriate to celebrate a particular day in the Trinity's honour. And there is, I think, a certain beauty in the fact that it falls on the Sunday after Pentecost, since it gives us a chance to look back over the whole of salvation history, which we have celebrated in the preceding liturgical seasons, a chance to reflect on the entire work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet, even before we reach Trinity Sunday, we celebrate two new feasts, at least in England and Wales. Mary, Mother of the Church, on the Monday following Pentecost, and the Feast of Jesus Christ, Eternal High Priest, on the Thursday of that same week. Both are a mixture of theology and devotion. Celebrating Mary as mother of the church, we reflect on Mary's role in bringing the church to birth, just as she brought Christ to birth. Present at the foot of the cross, she, out, she witnessed the outpouring of blood and water, the origins of the Eucharist and baptism, from the wounded side of her son. Present in prayer with the Apostles in the upper room after the Ascension, she was there with them at the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. She was there on the Church's birthday. And in celebrating Jesus as Eternal High Priest on the Thursday after Pentecost, we reflect both on his institution of the Eucharist on Maundy Thursday and on his continued role as intercessor, our great high priest, who constantly pleads for us in the presence of his Father. And, of course, there is the annual round of the Feast of Saints, this year beginning with the Feast of St. Bede the Venerable, monk, theologian, mathematician, and the first historian of the English church and people. And a few days later, the Feast of St. Augustine of Canterbury, the monk bishop who brought the Gospel and the Rule back to England in 597 AD, re-establishing the Roman liturgy in England. These Feasts of the Saints, whether local or universal in importance and celebration, are real aids to our faith. They are a constant reminder to us of the universal call to holiness, the Lord's call to each one of us to follow him on the way to sanctity and eternal life. And in reflecting on their lives, the challenges and struggles which they faced, their origins in every stratum of society, we are also reminded that the saints are people like us, ordinary people, who have led extraordinary lives through the action of God's grace. It reminds us that no one is excluded from the invitation to the Father's kingdom, and in that we should find great hope and great joy. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose gift we venerate the merits of all the saints, Bestow on us, we pray, through the prayers of so many intercessors, 
an abundance of the reconciliation with you, for which we earnestly long, through Christ our Lord. Amen.